those a different type of head pressure controls uh, along with fan cycling switches you try to maintain your your uh, condensing temperature right around 100 degrees uh, you know as it falls and rises with a fan cycling switch that can play havoc with an with an expansion valve so it's nice to have a, a, a mechanical control that actually holds the pressure back and maintains a, a steady pressure uh, filter dryers, of course, you know, changed out every time that you open up the system, um, and whenever they should happen to get uh, get plugged or or higher pressure drops. Uh, lubricants. Most of what's going on these days with lubricants is POE oil, and uh, you know, there's some PVE. There's other kinds of oils that are out there, but POE seems to be what everybody's using um, for the current HFC refrigerants and so you know we're uh, we're looking at, at that type of, of uh, scenario for all Copeland compressors or our uh, ester oil and we're going to talk about heat exchangers oil separators and suction accumulators first off the head pressure control it's a dual valve system this is different than the one that I showed in the basic uh, in 101 uh, this is a uh, adjustable uh, dual valve system wherein you have an OROA uh, or, or, you know, as a fixed device like a headmaster, that kind of thing, in the ORI, ORD combination is adjustable. Um, you got to have uh, adequate refrigerant charge for either of the above applications because what they do is they back up the liquid into the condenser, reducing the size, of, the effective size of the condenser and maintaining the head pressure in that manner it's just like this like it's changing the size of the, of the condenser to maintain a pressure when it does that it backs up the liquid refrigerant into the condenser and that's no longer available in the receiver so you've got to have enough refrigerant uh, a large enough receiver to cover uh, the uh, uh, volume of the condenser as well as your liquid line so in the operating stuff um, where you want to maintain a wide enough differential on a fan control to uh, uh, not allow short cycling. So 50 pounds is a lot of times what guys shoot for, uh, 200 on the cut in, 150 on the cut out, and just uh, let that ride back and forth like that. Depending on the gas, of course, if it's 134A, you're going to be lower pressures than that. And, uh, you know, that, that fan cycling control is a reverse acting uh, head pressure control so if we look at this two valve system though in the head pressure control valve the ORI this is basically the evaporator pressure regulator but it is a different range these are 65 to 225 pounds and uh, uh, they operate on an open on rise type scenario in other words as the pressure increases on the on the inlet to the valve it passes that refrigerant through um, and it's adjustable at the top. You have, let's get my pointer going here. At the top, when you take this cap off, you can see that there's a hex key or a hex down in the, in the inside the Allen type situation. You can adjust the amount of pressure on this spring that's holding against the poppet and the seed disc. And that's, uh, that's how you adjust the different pressures uh, that this thing is adjustable for. Like I said, it's 65 to 225 pounds. Uh, so it's, uh, it's significantly different than most uh, evaporator pressure regulators. Um, again, it holds back, you know, or floods refrigerant into the condenser to increase the TD um, and uh, the head pressure as well. So when you look at the other valve that's in, involved with this, it's the ORD. The ORD valve is an open on rise differential valve. In other words, when the differential gets above 20 pounds, it goes ahead and bypasses and uh, uh, gets down to 20 pounds. So, you know, the way it's used in conjunction with the ORI valve is like this, as the ORI closes off as the condenser pressure goes down. Okay, this is an open on rise of inlet, and well, it's close on fall of inlet. So as the as the inlet pressure into this valve 
uh, starts to go down, it starts to back it up and, and hold it back into the condenser. The ORD, the differential valve here, maintains that, that once this starts to close down, this side of your pressure starts to fall, so you've got a differential between here and here that, uh, that is bypassed through the ORD, and it maintains the pressure in the receiver so it can continue to feed refrigerant to the expansion valve. The ROA, we looked at this the other day um, in 101 uh, rather extensively, but uh, in essence, it's a, a non-adjustable valve. It has uh, a, a nitrogen charge or an air charge up inside here, and that just plays that pressure against the pressure of the of the uh, discharge coming back from uh, coming up from the uh, compressor and uh, changes the the uh, position of the valve to maintain the head pressure inside the receiver the uh, uh, receiver and uh, actually they say this is not adjustable and this is kind of funny um, the uh, you can this is a charging stub right here and that's how they set the pressure of the uh, under that dome. Uh, I've had guys actually cut that that little uh, thing off and uh, put a charging port on it so they can charge the liquid or charge nitrogen into it and change the pressure of the setting. Uh, kind of different, but uh, I wouldn't trust it, and it changes the UL status status of it. So here's how it's uh, it's piped in. You got your condenser effluent comes in here in the bottom of the OROA. You've got your bypass line that comes in here, and this goes to the receiver. So when uh, that's as the condenser side, as the side starts to fall in pressure, it uh, closes off and feeds a little bit of discharge gas through to the receiver to maintain that pressure. It backs up the and floods the condenser, and again the receiver has to be large enough to cover the uh, volume of the condenser. Heat exchangers. These are used for a lot of different things. Um, you know, one is to gain efficiency, another one is to gain uh, subcooling. If you've got a really high rise, uh, a rise up above the uh, uh, condensing unit to go up to the evaporator, uh, this can give you additional subcooling for your liquid lines so you don't uh, start making bubbles because, you know, as your pressure in drop increases in your liquid line going up, uh, you lose subcooling and eventually get to a point where you start to make uh, bubbles and expansion valves don't like bubbles. So what the heat exchanger does is it exchanges the, the temperature of the uh, liquid coming through it with the suction coming back to the compressor. And uh, that chills the, the liquid and, and uh, also warms the suction gas a little bit. If there's any liquid refrigerant that's coming back with it, it'll, it'll tend to uh, help evaporate that before it gets back to the compressor. So, you know, they're used uh, um, in some applications to uh, actually gain capacity at your expansion valve. Like uh, Ed was saying yesterday, uh, the expansion valves or the refrigerant gains capacity as it gets colder. So any, anywhere under 100 degrees, which is the 1.0 mark, uh, you start gaining capacity from the liquid temperature changing. Um, oil separator. Oil separator inlet. In essence, you've got your discharge gas coming from your compressors going in this inlet and back out this outlet. What, it ha what happens is a change in speed and volume. So, you know, as it comes flying in here at 700 feet per minute, all of a sudden it's got a big cavity in here to, to expand into. And when it does, it slows down and makes this turn. And when it makes that turn and impacts these, uh, these screens, the oil impinges on the screens, it drips off and falls into the bottom. The uh, uh, float right here is for proving that there's liquid before it will allow the, the valve to open at the bottom. If there's enough liquid, the valve opens up, it comes up to the oil return line and back to the reservoir where it's stored until it's, ne it's necessary to be fed to the compressors. Um, 
you know, they say it's not for coolers, but you know, when you have situations where you have, even in HVAC, uh, it might be advantageous to have an oil separator when you've got a really, really long, long run with, uh, with, you know, a lot of fall to it from the condensing unit to the evaporator or the air handler. Um, you know, keeping that oil closer to the compressors sometimes is a good idea. A suction accumulator. Suction accumulator is there, well, in heat pump applications, it's used all the time because you're very close to, you've got an expansion valve and an evaporator in the heat mode that uh, when you go through a defrost uh, in the heat mode, it switches back into heat and, uh, and the liquid refrigerant comes flying back to the compressor. The, the accumulator is there to stop that refrigerant before it gets to the, uh, gets to the compressor. Uh, it has three ports, uh, or two ports on the top, and one in the bottom. The A port is the inlet port, and it's, uh, it, it doesn't show as being uh, directly in there. It's actually offset from it. And in, in, in any case, there's a uh, plate that's attached to the inside of this piece that directs it further away, so it actually spins it. Uh, then the B port over here is the return back to the compressor. So any liquid refrigerant would come in, fall into the bottom here, along with any oil, and be boiled off and brought back through this J-tube, past this orifice, and back up this way. The, that orifice serves to uh, pick up any oil and liquid refrigerants in the bottom and meter them into the suction, coming back to the compressor as another uh, another safety. So, um, you know, accumulator is not a bad idea. Any low temp applications, uh, hot gas uh, defrost, that kind of thing, uh, very advantageous to have them. So, and with that, I'm going to switch over to Mr. Seffens. All right, let me see. Uh, let me get the ball. Where are you? You got it? I believe, I believe so. Uh, let me see here. I believe. Nope, that's not it. <laughs> Where am I? I need to close off some uh, applications here. What happened? Come on. Just close that out. Are we in? Yeah, we good to go? Good to go. All right. So we're we're going to take a look at uh, 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 line sizing, both the liquid line and the suction line. We're not going to take into consideration the the discharge line and or the liquid um, drop leg from the from the condenser down the receiver and stuff like that. However. Those charts are available. We're just looking at the line sets from the from the condensing unit over to the uh, evaporator or evaporators. And I'm using the um, Heatcraft Engineering Manual. We'll we'll go through some a couple of charts with the uh, Engineering Manual. This one's dated April 2008, and um, you can actually download this as a PDF file from the Heat Heatcraft website. Um, and it's uh, it's a good useful tool for um, for designing and laying out systems, and and it has some really good information in there. So our objective today is to, uh, when we're looking at um, liquid lines and suction lines uh, for sizing and selecting them and stuff, what we want to do when we size these these lines, we we take into consideration that we want to size the suction line at a two degree. Uh, Suction line, suction line loss, and um, and a one degree liquid line equivalent loss. And what what we're doing is 
is when we convert those over to pressures for the, both the suction and the, and the liquid light, and you're looking at anywhere from about a two to four pound pressure drop across that entire line set. And that's just the line itself, not necessarily the components that are in the line, such as with the liquid line, you have the, um, the, um, the side glass and the filter dryer and such, and the solenoid if you have a solenoid. Uh, we also want to take a look at the, um, when you're sizing, take into consideration when you're sizing your liquid line, you want to try to, and Kevin alluded to this the other day, you want to try to, to locate the condensing unit as close to the evaporator as you, as you can, um, minimum, minimizing the, the liquid line uh, or the liquid refrigerant cost because that's, that's pretty expensive, right? So, and not only that, but the uh, suction lines, if, uh, uh, if you have a long run, I've seen lines up to 50 yards sometimes, some large industrial refrigeration plants and stuff. But that's the only way that they could actually run these lines up on top of the roof and everything. So, um, yeah, take into consideration the overall cost um, that's uh, that's involved. Uh, of course, you want to get the job right if you um, if you're bidding against some other contractors and such. Okay, we always want to make sure we get an adequate oil return back in the suction line. Make sure our velocities are up. We said this before that the Velocities in the suction line can uh, should be anywhere from 500 to 700 feet per minute if we can, and the reason for that is to uh, help uh, carry the oil back to the compressor. So, uh, always slope your suction lines in the direction of one quarter inch per every 10 feet, and of course, uh, always comply with the local and national codes when you're working on designing systems. So when I'm when I'm sizing the line, what I want to find out first is the equivalent length of the total run, um, and that's both the liquid line and the suction line, right? So we, the first thing we need to do is we need to calculate or figure out what our actual linear footage is for that run, um, and uh, and and that whether that's actually visiting the job site, and for the most part, you're going to visit the job site anyway to do a valve takeoff, a system takeoff, and you're going to review what you have, uh, where's the best location available for both the evaporators and the condenser and all that stuff. So you're actually going to job walk the facility prior to figuring out and, and, um, and calculating your, your valves and your, and your actual linear footage for that run. But you also want to know how many uh, valves are in the, in the circuit or in the lines, you all, and you need to know also how many fittings you have. All right, so both the fittings and the linear footage equate to the equivalent length of the line run. We also need to know what refrigerant, obviously, that we're, we're using in the system. Looking for the balance capacity. And um, for instance, if you have a condenser that has uh, two, two evaporators, uh, you know, uh, the combined evaporator capacity, if, we're, if each, capaci uh, each evaporator is, is sized at, uh, 10, 10 tons each, then we're, of course, we're going to run our mains out that, uh, to each of these evaporators uh, and consider that that would be uh, 20 tons and then break those off to 10 tons once we get to the, um, and, and we'll show that, we'll illustrate that. Need to know the operating temperatures, right? So what, what, are, your, what are your evaporating temperatures? So I've got an example here, and again, if you, um, you're not going to do that now because normally when we give this class, we're right in front of a bunch of people and we actually hand out some literature so that they can follow along with us when we, give, uh, when we go through the charts and everything. Unfortunately, we won't be able to do that. So again, I encourage that you download the engineering manual. But in this example, we have 24,000 BTUs R404A system. So we got a two-ton system, R404A as a refrigerant. Our suction temperature at the evaporators that we're working with is minus 10 degrees. So again, we're probably looking at a zero degree box. Um, the actual uh, linear run of the, line, uh, of the line sets are 130 feet. Uh, and we're calculating, again, this is our, our valve takeoff when we're, uh, and our line takeoff when we're designing the system. We're, con we're actually think, uh, considering the fact that we may have 990 degree elbows in both the liquid line and the suction line. 
So we need to find the suction uh, line size, the riser size, uh, if there's a vertical, uh, you know, from the, from the evaporator into the condenser, and also the liquid line size. So as we look at the charts here, going from left to right, on the left-hand side of the chart, we have the capacities that we're working with, system capacity and, and BTUs, okay, right? At the top, we're looking at uh, what refrigerant, and there's different um, charts for each refrigerant. So in this case, we're looking for 404A and 507, but we have charts for R22, 134A. And I'm sure now that uh, I haven't checked the latest edition, I don't know if there is a new edition with the engineering manual, but I would assume that they probably have some additions with uh, different refrigerants now. Um, so we need, uh, this one here, uh, we're looking at the suction line and um, our different temperatures that we have uh, at the evaporator. So we got plus 20, plus 10, minus 10. Um, and then over here we got uh, minus 20, minus 20 continuing. Okay, so uh, we're going all the way up to 75 feet over here and then continuing from 100 feet over to 200 feet, minus 30 degrees, minus 40. And then on the right side of the chart, we have our liquid line size, okay. And then the actual line sizes below, depending on what your capacities are and stuff. So let's let's take a look at this. So we're at uh, 24,000 BTUs. All right, looking at 150 feet. In this case, it was 100. And, uh, what was it, 130 feet actual? So instead, of, rather than going 100 dropping down to 100 feet, we're penalizing ourselves pretty much because we're actually looking at a one and one eighth line. So the difference between the two, if I, you know, some of the guy, I've seen contractors where they're actually undersized the, um, the suction line to get the job, uh, especially if there's a long, uh, long run, um, 100 feet or whatever it may be. And what they'll do is rather than sizing or selecting one and three eighths, they'll go down to one and one eighth just so that they could get the job. Well, in a sense, what you're doing is you're you're actually causing the compressor to operate outside of its operating envelope because you're dropping the suction uh, much lower than what it should be, and it could be detrimental to the life of the compressor. So uh, we always want to bump it up if, if we're right in between the two, uh, 100 and 150 feet. So we're at 130 feet, so let's look at 150 feet. So in this case, uh, In this case, take a look at this. So inch and three eighths can actually work for um, 150 feet and 200 feet in particular, right? So that covers both the 150 feet and 200 feet. So we're gonna we're gonna tentatively look at the possibility that this could be a one and three eighths, and I would assume and predict that that's actually the case, right? So the liquid line, 150 feet. Again, we're taking into consideration that we're looking at 100, 130 feet. But take a look at um, the uh, half inch. Half inch liquid lines uh, covers a long range of uh, lengths itself. So I would say that <clears throat> just by looking at this chart, that, that uh, half inch is a really good, uh, a really good guess on this one. Now let's take a look at the equivalent, um, the values for the fittings itself. Um, so inch and three eighths for the suction side <clears throat> at a 90 degree elbow, we're looking at uh, four feet per fitting, okay? And we have nine fittings, so we have to take that into consideration. For the half inch, it's only one foot per fitting. So again, at uh, nine fittings for the uh, uh, for the uh, inch and three eighths, we're looking at at uh, 160, 60, uh, 166 feet total, and the liquid line at 139 feet total, which uh, proves in our assumption that inch and three eighths would actually work for this application, and same with half inch. Let's look at the riser here. How do we select the riser? So if we go back to minus uh, minus 10. And inch and th inch and three eighths, and I'm just uh, picking this off the top of my head before I 
advance the slide. Engine 3A is what we want to do is, um, is in this chart, we actually go backwards in the chart for the riser selection and size until we hit the gray box with the number, uh, with, the, with the size inside there. In this case, it would be 1 and 1 eighth, uh, and that would be the selection for the riser. Uh, a good rule of thumb pretty much is the fact that, uh, look, whatever size you're working with, um, always drop it back to the next size. So um, in this case, we're working one and, one and three eighths, drop it down to one and one eighth for the liquid vertical or the suction vertical riser. Um, if you have a one and uh, one and one eighth, drop it back down to seven eighths. And again, what we're doing there is we're, the only reason why we're doing that is just to increase the velocity of the gas on the vertical riser just to carry the oil back to the compressor. It's very important. So uh, what, what's a P-trap and how do P-traps work? Why are they installed in systems and stuff? So we say that um, approximately every 20 feet of riser um, or vertical that you have, depending on your, uh, the location of the evaporator, um, in relation to the roof or where the, wherever their, your condensing unit may be, uh, whether it's one story or two stories or three stories up and stuff, um, you always want to take into consideration that there's a, you may need uh, multiple P-traps or maybe one P-trap, depending on the length that you're working with. Okay, And we say that uh, you should have a P-trap every 20 feet, but optimum is uh, anywhere from 8 to 10 feet. The problem with that is is the cost, right? Because that the cost associated with uh, not only the labor with... Uh, installing the, the, the P-traps, but also the, the, the parts themselves. Okay, so we say that this is a, in an incorrect um, uh, way to pipe this uh, one particular P-trap, and the reason why that is is because we want to have a full liquid drain with the oil back down into the P-trap rather than damming up this area right here. With the, with the reduced fitting, right? So we're damming this oil. We actually reduce the internal uh, size of this pipe and um, with the suction pipe going back to the, the uh, back to the compressor and stuff like that. So we want to keep this at full length, um, again, or full uh, diameter. In this case, it would be one and three eighths. We drop back down. And then on our vertical riser, we reduce, we, we reduce right when we start to um, incur the the rise itself. So in this case, we drop it down to one and one eighth back up to um, the condensing unit and stuff. But the way this works is as the oil collects down into this P trap, the velocity of the gas coming back is is um, high enough in a sense that that will actually carry the oil up through the 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 reduced uh, riser back and. Um, Again, we say that our velocities here is anywhere from 500 to 700 feet per minute. Our velocities in the riser itself can be anywhere from 1,000 to 1,200 feet per minute going back. Um, it, uh, it jumps up quite a bit. <clears throat> and here's a, um, uh, here's a scenario of a possibility itself. We've got the conden condensing unit up on the roof. Our evaporator is down. Maybe this is a restaurant, or maybe it's a hotel or so, with the condensing unit up on top of the roof, and and this is the area where um, all the cooks and the and the, the kitchen area itself. So what we're doing here is is we're actually sloping the suction line right here into the P-trap. Okay, um, after the P-trap, I don't show it, but this should be a reduced line right here. So we're taking into consideration that this is one and three eighths. Once we get to this point right here, we're looking at one and one eighth. Then we put an inverted P-trap on the top. And again, what we're doing here is we're just trying to create some traps here so that we're not collecting the oil back or causing the oil to come back to the uh, evaporator during the off cycle when the, when the system shuts off. So we're just trapping this oil in these certain areas of the piping um, so that, um, again, we don't log the oil back in the evaporator and such. So we have an inverted, inverted P-trap. Again, we, have, we slope this back to the P-trap, and then again, we'll, uh, we'll reduce down to one and uh, one-eighth to the inverted P-trap back to the uh, condensing unit. Always slope, uh, slope the line back to the, uh, the compressor 
if we can. Again, a quarter per 10 foot of piping. Um, what we're saying here, never pipe out of the suction, uh, out of the top of the suction line. So in, in a sense, what we're saying is if this evaporator was right below the, the condenser, we don't want to come straight out and up to the, the condenser itself, right? Again, during the off cycle, the oil would tend to come back down and, and kind of pool in the in the evaporator and stuff. We don't want to do that. We want to we want to keep the evaporator as as free and clear of of oil as much as possible, especially during the off cycle. Um, liquid lines. Make sure you uh, you can pull from the bottom of the liquid line. That's perfectly fine. I have some illustrations to show that. And again, when you're brazing. Make sure you use some type of inert uh, gas to keep the uh, the inside of the of the pipe cool, not cool, clean, right? Um, and use um, uh, the appropriate silver solder, silphos, whatever it may be. <clears throat> All right, here we, I have a couple of illustrations now. If I was a contractor competing another against another contractor and looking at the cost and the labor. It, uh, it would take to uh, to design either one of these systems. This one right here on the bottom would actually be a, a much uh, less expensive uh, system to lay out and design. However, <clears throat> and that's why you have the job walk. When you go to the job walk, because you don't know what the inside of the box entails. You don't know what it what you're gonna, you're going to be up against. Maybe this is not adequate, and there's a lot of product that's underneath here, right? And we don't want to have um, uh, product banging up against our, our, our lines and such. So rather than have it um, on a free flowing um, or free, free draining back to the P-trap, and this is acceptable, this is perfectly fine, right? And we're sloping the lines back to the P-trap. Once we hit the P-trap, we reduce back up to the condenser. And this is doing essentially doing the same thing. We're uh, free draining down into the P-trap, we uh, reduced the size here, put an inverted, and this is our main going back to the um, back to the P-trap that uh, going to the vertical. We may not have to reduce the size right here, right? Okay, but we would probably most likely reduce the size of the P-trap after the P-trap right here. Um, and take a look also if we have a 10-ton evaporator, and this is a 10-ton evaporator, we'll probably look at um, one in um, <clears throat> one and one eighth suction line going back. I'm just picking a number at the, off the top of my head. And again, this evaporator is also sized at one and one eighth going back. And once they connect into the header itself, this size may may bump up to one and three eighths, um, depending on the capacities that we're working on. And you size this up just like we went through the example a few minutes ago for sizing and selecting line sizes. How come it's not advancing? There we go. <clears throat> You'll probably never see this, but this is uh, driving a point here. Again, this uh, evaporator is on top. We're just free draining down into the main. Uh, the second one below that, we're doing the same thing. We're free draining down into the main. But take a look at the, the bottom evaporator. We're actually install a P-trap here and an inverted P-trap. Again, if this was all combined and teed into one um, arrangement, um, and tied into the main going back to the, the condenser. During the off cycle, all the oil would actually pool and collect down at the bottom right here. So we're trying to prevent that during the off cycle again. So we are uh, run a P-trap and an inverted P-trap um, and run that back out to the, the um, condenser. <clears throat> so when we're uh, sizing and selecting, always size to the full capacity for the main and then individually size the liquid and the suction lines um, per each evaporator. And that's, again, that's for uh, the liquid line and the suction line. <clears throat> so in this case we have, I'm going to pick a number, we have uh, two stacked evaporators. Here's our, our uh, we don't have an expansion valve. We're not showing the expansion valve and stuff. This is for illustration purposes. So if this, if each evaporator is 10 tons, maybe where this was a 5/8 liquid line, and this is a 5/8 liquid line, we're pulling off the bottom of the bottom of the main, which is perfectly fine. Maybe the main line here would be 7/8, and that's the combined capacities for both evaporators, right? Our suction line. Um, Pretty much the same thing. 
again, we size each uh, each line coming or being tapped off of the um, each evaporator. This would be one and three eighths per se, and this or one and one eighth. This is one and one eighth. We're running the trap and then the inverted trap onto the suction line to prevent the oil from going back and also prevent the oil from if, if again if this was plumbed in down at the bottom of the main right here we would have a bunch of oil trapped in the bottom right here so again we want to make sure that we put an inverted trap on the top carry the oil back with the velocities of the gas <clears throat> what's a double suction riser <clears throat> Double suction risers, we, we use those for um, systems that have uh, capacity control, like our, our, our new uh, XFAM uh, digitals would be a perfect application for something like this. Uh, again, you're looking at cost, you're looking at the, the elevations that's involved, um, uh, but you're also looking at uh, callbacks. You want to reduce the amount of callbacks coming back because callbacks can be expensive and it's on your dime, right? So <clears throat> our minimum velocities that we're shooting for is 1,000 feet per minute if we can. And again, I said earlier that uh, you're looking at velocities in some cases up to 1,200 feet per minute for uh, for the gas flow coming back. So. Here, what we've done, <clears throat> now there's two schools of thought. One school of thought, of thought is that you size both lines um, for 100%. <clears throat> and um, we're, uh, the second P-trap, we got the main P-trap here, and this is that size for the full load. Uh, again, let's take 10, uh, 10 tons as an illustration right here. So we got this, this one sized at 10 tons, and this one, we want to drop at 40%, uh, right? So we'll size this this vertical right here at at four tons, and this uh, and this size at 10 tons. So the gas coming back to the 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 condenser itself, the flow of the gas always takes the path of least resistance, right? So in this case, um, during standard normal operating um, you know capacities, anything above 40%. Um, we can uh, we'll actually run through the velocity of the gas will run through the the main header right here main vertical and then when our um, and we're carrying and pulling our oil right here uh, again doing the same thing as a standard p-trap however when we <clears throat> get to anything below 40 percent um, uh, capacity what happens is the oil actually blocks us this, this this area right here in the p-trap and and causes the um, the gas then to be redirected up to the minimum uh, or the smaller uh, vertical going back. Again, I said there was two schools of style. One is to size both of them as as the 100%, and then this one down at 40%, or you can size this at full load, and this one at 40%. Right. So it just depends on. <clears throat> On the, do I have an, do I have a personal preference? Um, no, um, I usually size at the this whole system combined together, and the reason why that is is because is because of the cost of the pipe itself, and both of them will handle full load <clears throat> during uh, full load applications. Again, our X F A um, A M and Scott Avini and, and Julie. I have and I are going to talk about that right after this class here. Um, those those units can ramp down to uh, by default 20% of its rate of capacity. So if we have a 10 ton, we don't. We have uh, uh, we go up to five hor uh, we go up to six horsepower in those units. But I'm again I'm using this as an illustration by because making uh, making sense of this. If I have a 10 ton system, <clears throat> we drop down to 20% of its rate of capacity, we're actually looking at 10, uh, 2 tons <clears throat> operating conditions right there. So um, this is our, again, this is our double suction riser, typical for um, systems that have reduced load capacities and full load capacities. Some <clears throat> typical piping um, scenarios and recommendations and stuff like that. You certainly don't want to pipe close to the compressor itself because uh, compressors tend to to vibrate and stuff, and this could create a, a weak point in the um, in the pipe and, and cause it to crack. And and you dump if that's the case, you could 
possibly dump your entire charge and you don't you don't want to do that so you want to have some little bit of wiggle room right here <clears throat> right and clamp up uh, a little bit higher uh, up on the walls just to, to prevent that from uh, from breaking make sure you're using an inert gas nitrogen to prevent the the pipes from uh, oxidizing um, <clears throat> And uh, to keep the inside of the pipe really clean, um, seal floss. Make sure you use seal floss. If you have to use any flux, use a little bit, uh, limited amount, um, to prevent uh, a lot of junk inside the uh, the tubing itself. But why do we insulate our <coughs> refrigerant lines after we leak check? Right, right. Well, after we pipe everything in into uh, into um, uh, the system and everything. Uh, Run a leak check on the pipe, both on the system itself. Make sure we're not. Uh, uh, make sure we don't have any leaks, and of course, if there are, then repair them and stuff. Um, so, <clears throat> um, Armaflex, Armaflex on the on the suction lines, a minimum of three quarter inch, if you can, depending on your um, on what uh, types of uh, uh, systems you're working with, you can get down to minus 40. Um, on some applications and stuff, it may not uh, require three quarter. Maybe require something that's a little bit larger. <clears throat> and our liquid lines too. Again, our XFAL systems, uh, you can actually uh, our condensing units, uh, the low temp um, X line units, they can run where the uh, where our liquid temperature is feeding the evaporators can get to a point where we are uh, see a lot of condensate on the liquid line. So um, it, it is suggested that uh, you take a look at that and possibly insulate the liquid lines going out to the evaporator from the X-line units. <clears throat> Let's take a look at uh, condensate drains. <clears throat> on the condensate drains, make sure that uh, you don't use PVC pipe. Um, PVC pipe can eventually in time will break and uh, snap. Uh, always plumb the condensate lane, uh, li line with either copper or steel. Once you, once you penetrate through the box outside on the back side, always put a P-trap on the back. Um, <clears throat> so as, uh, what we want to do is uh, that prevents any air um, to get back up into the yeah, ambient air or ambient conditions if there's moisture out there to get back and uh, to the evaporator and stuff creates a, an additional load and we don't need that. So <clears throat> after defrost what happens is a, um, the condensate comes down and pools in the P-trap right here and cre creates a seal to prevent that from happening. Um, anything, um, <clears throat> if you're working with boxes lower, uh, lower than I would say minus 10 degrees, here we're saying minus uh, 20 degrees box room. Make sure that uh, we use heat tape and then insulate the heat tape. Make sure it's insulated um, to prevent that load on the evaporators. <clears throat> so we don't talk about box sizing here in this class, unfortunately. And we do have that uh, that uh, that website that's available for uh, box sizing, and I recommend it. It's it's actually a really good. Um, Good program. Brian uh, Binacek talked about that the other day, <clears throat> and it really is a good program. Like I say, but when you're looking at uh, a box itself, and you're maybe you're walking the box and and uh, kind of doing a a, a walkthrough for the system, take a look at the penetrations and and um, you know not only the penetrations are there any leaks in them in the doors. Uh, check the doors, see how they close properly. Um, you know, <clears throat> make sure that uh, they do. It does have a good uh, closure. Also, you want to check the seams and the seals in the box. Make sure that they're up to up to par. You may have to replace the box, or make some uh, adjustments to um, to fix the box itself. If there's a lot of cracks and and the seams are separated and such. <clears throat> so, um, again, door usage. Some uh, I've seen people use the strip curtains. And some people don't like the strip curtains. Some of the restaurants they prefer not to have strip curtains and stuff. But the longer you have that door open, uh, you're inducing that load inside the box itself, uh, creating more load on on the evaporators and such. And um, so, you know, um, 
I prefer to use strip curtains or they have air curtains as well to uh, help uh, isolate the box, um, what's happening inside the box to what's going out in the, maybe in the kitchen or so. <clears throat> also the lights, um, with all the with all the new lights that they have now, um, what are they? The LCD lights or whatever. Um, they don't. Uh, they're a lot, um, lot less uh, load conducting um, per se as as the old lights that we used to have. So, <clears throat> also the motor loads, uh, whether that's a forklift or the motors that are on the evaporators themselves, they create a load and the heat. Um, again, the defrost um, heater operation. Make sure that the that the um, your condensate line, your drain line, if it's insulated or if it is um, is wrapped with uh, electrical tape, to make sure you insulate the lines. Going back, <clears throat> uh, let's see. And uh, here we got some nice penetrations. Make sure you uh, again when you're walking the the box itself, take a look at the penetrations with the verticals and and the condensate line, uh, line coming coming off the <clears throat> the pan itself. Uh, just um, you know that signs like this is an indication that we we have a uh, uh, that we need to seal that up and make it a little bit better for um, heat transfer and stuff in the in the box. So let's see where are we with that. <clears throat> I think we are um, pretty much done unless Kevin wants to move a little bit forward with the defrost. That's up to him. I think we should break there. Julie, I couldn't okay. hear you. It's it's yeah. um, your. I was I was on mute, but uh, I'm off mute now. I think if uh, if that's a good place to, to stop, we'll go ahead and stop for the day. Um, that's a good place to. So thank you, every thank you, everyone. We will uh, pick up.